In 2015, world leaders committed to providing quality health services to everyone by 2030. We have less than 10 years to reach the goal of universal health coverage, and yet over half the world still lacks access to essential primary health care. As a consequence, 930 million people are at risk of falling into poverty due to out-of-pocket spending on their health needs. Digital technologies hold the potential of accelerating progress to health for all. Effectively deployed, digital technologies can strengthen health systems, support individuals to better manage their own health, and enhance the availability, accessibility, affordability, and quality of health services. Digital Health Week is a global moment to champion the role of digital health in universal health coverage. During Digital Health Week, Organizations around the world are coming together to host events, make public commitments, and shine a light on the successes and challenges of digital health and UHC in their contexts. During Digital Health Week, civil society, private companies, government health ministries, and interested individuals are discussing the challenges and opportunities for digital health in their countries and regions. So join us during Digital Health Week. To champion health for all in the digital age, hold discussions, make commitments, and amplify the role of digital health on your organization's website and on social media. Just in case, es está apagado, but I think it's okay anyway. Sí. Okay, so welcome everybody to this hybrid session. We have a few less in-person people than projected, but that's perfectly good. You all have your space. Um, so welcome to the event that's hosted by the Governing House Futures 2030 Growing Up in a Digital World. It's a Financial Times and Mindset Commission, and we recently lost, launched our report uh, on the 25th of October, so just a couple months ago. Uh, I would like to... Uh, Give a few opening uh, remarks in regards to a uh, shout out to the Global Health Initiative here at the Institute, who is collaborating with us on COVID in this event. And also just to give a short uh, agenda opening, because I know that it's the end of the year. I know that we've all been on virtual meetings, trying to manage hybrid sessions. Uh, and so I just want to flag that we're really hoping that the session will be very informal and also a roundtable discussion. So we're welcoming people from in the audience. We have Adash here from our team who will be on the chat and he'll raise those questions as well. So just a short overview, we'll do some opening videos um, and then we'll go through a little fireside chat with each of our panelists and then we will open up to, to Q&A. And just a caveat for opening video, so this was a, around digital health. That's something that's going on uh, the whole week to our colleagues at Transform the World. So a huge shout out to them as well. I will go ahead and show the opening video to the Commission, uh, just to give a bit of an understanding to what the Commission report is. And then I will go ahead and share the video, which is a bit of a reflection from our co-chair, Globally renowned expert in global Our world is rapidly changing. Digital technologies and data are changing to health and the design of health systems. But governance models haven't kept up. This creates uneven effects globally. The Lancet and Financial Times Commission, Governing Health Futures 2030, Growing Up in a Digital World, 
shows how digital transformations are changing our health futures. In October 2019, 19 commissioners were brought together to develop the report. These commissioners considered a wide range of governance approaches, ethical guidelines, and institutional responsibilities that must be considered to improve health and well-being in an increasingly digital world. Commission meetings prompted open dialogue and shaped the heart of the commissioner's report. The Commission engaged with stakeholders, including various international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and decision-makers at the global and regional levels. The novelty of this collaboration between The Lancet and The Financial Times also allowed for private sector engagement without compromising the independence of the Commission. There were three key findings. First, young people's experiences growing up in a digital world are just as diverse as their lived experiences. They are excited about the benefits digital transformations will have for their health and well-being, but they are concerned about online risks, finding trustworthy information, knowledge on how their data is being used, and whether these technologies are grounded in human rights. Secondly, the Commission identified a solidarity-led approach to health data and addressing digital determinants of health to be important for maximizing the public health value of digital transformations. However, these are missing from most governance approaches. Lastly, we discovered that all countries are looking to use digital technologies to improve their health services and make better use of their health data. Most countries have already developed digital health strategies, but they are yet to adopt an approach based on the principles of data solidarity, digital trust, accountability, and public participation. The Commission found that these principles are key to advancing health equity and resolving privacy concerns. Digital transformations have the potential to improve everyone's health and will allow young people to have a role in making decisions about their health futures. But this is only possible if collective action is taken to strengthen the governance of digital technologies and data so they benefit everyone. For this to happen, governments, companies, and other organizations must take collective action by building a governance architecture that fosters trust, addresses the role of digital technologies as determinants of health, enacts a new approach to data collection and usage based on data solidarity, and invests in the enablers of digital transformations for public health and UHC. Our health futures are being decided now. If governments and companies adopt a value-based approach to governing digital transformations, everyone will move one step closer to reaching a sustainable future where health for all is realized. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to the students here at the Graduate Institute, to students and young people all around the world and anybody else who is joining us uh, for this exciting event. Uh, you have uh, just seen the video that explains to you what our commission about growing up in a digital world, uh, governing health futures has tried to do You've heard about the four key areas we want to work in. And I just want to highlight a couple of points that have been uh, particularly important for me. Uh, first of all, it's really your future. And uh, your future is being defined right now. And that is why from the commission, we were absolutely adamant that you must play a role in that definition. Very frequently, young people are referred to as future leaders. No, you're not future leaders. You are leaders here and now. And we see that in the environment. I hope we get to see it more in health. And I definitely hope we will see much, much more of it in relation to the digital transformation. Because our societies and our future, also the future of older people like me, are being redefined right now. It's about great transformations. In living through the pandemic, we are experiencing an enormous health transformation. We need to rethink how we understand health 
and we have learned how important health equity is. We've learned again who has access and who does not. And unless we address that, the future of health will not be good. We've learned in that context also the importance of the digital transformation. A number of countries who have used digital means to let their people participate in the response to COVID-19 have had much better success. And I underline that, not those that have, under, that have used the digital transformation to control their population, uh, but those that have allowed their people to participate in uh, this transformation, in the need to respond uh, to the pandemic, and also uh, in uh, transforming their environments. We have uh, fantastic examples of what is called civic tech, about how a new form of governance, of stewardship, of data collectives, etc., is emerging, and you, the young people, should play an absolutely central role in that. And of course, the third big transformation is the ecological transformation, is the climate uh, transformation. And as I said, young people are already such a critical voice here and uh, they need to move it forward. And if I could use uh, what one of your uh, climate leaders, Greta, has said, what we don't want in any of these three big transformations is a lot of blah, blah. We want good governance, we want responsible governance, and we want those that are in power now to take that responsibility. That is why our report gives a whole range of indications of what kind of governance is needed, what kind of stewardship is needed. And in relation to health, we, of course, have put the public health values of equity and the public uh, health values of uh, access to universal health coverage right in the center. And we have used the health promotion uh, principle of key participation as one of our guiding lights. Some of you might know that uh, I was lucky enough to join the WHO when I was quite a young person, at least compared to everyone else in WHO. I was in my early 30s and I was asked to work on women's health, on women's health movements, and later on in developing health promotion. And it was my own experience in the women's health movement that led me to understand how important people's participation is in health, how important patient participation is in health. And these values and these principles have always stuck with me. It's equity, it's voice, it's participation. We used to call it empowerment. I have learned from young people that one had better say enfranchisement. So I always try to do that now. And I hope that uh, in setting uh, these kind of principles also for the Lancet report and highlighting that together we need to start seeing the digital transformation as a determinant of health, not as something that just accompanies health, that uh, adds a little bit of digital health here and a little bit of digital health there, but something that is really changing the way we think and the way we live, and that is influencing our health in tremendous ways. You also have experienced this during the pandemic. We have been talking about the mental health consequences. We've been talking about uh, the other issues that have arisen around body image, around uh, uh, discriminating people uh, on the internet, in quotes. Those are all things that we need to take forward, that need to be governed responsible, and that need to allow a better future. So I wish I could be there with you. I hope you will take these issues forward. I'm delighted that some other commissioners are joining this discussion 
and are sharing with you the various areas into which we have looked more carefully, for example, uh, the humanitarian space. And I hope that uh, from this meeting, you will be able to continue uh, really important work in redefining our digital futures and redefining our health futures. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Okay, so that's a huge shout out to Alona, who is our co-chair. Um, she's also been a professor here for years, so several of you might have had classes with her. I'm not sure now. Uh, I'm a bit older, I think, but still, uh, a huge shout out to Alona. She apologized that she couldn't be here, but I also thought it's a really fitting opening statement from her, uh, and we'll feed out some of those points that she's made in her presentation a little bit later on in the Q&A. Right now, we want to be a bit more, get some information from you. We've had a couple videos. Um, so if you could all scan this Mentimeter code with your phone, we're trying to create a word cloud here, answering the question, in one word, what can you do to co-create health futures in our digital world? So if you're unable to scan the code, you should also be able to go to minty.com uh, and enter this Five zero five five eight five four five for any of you on mobiles that can see the screen quite clearly. Okay, great, we're having some votes come in. We've got participate, innovate, creativity, advocate. I don't see anyone that's hit more than once, so we're all individualistic on this perspective, which is also nice. <laughs> okay, great. So we'll capture this uh, and we'll bring it on uh, a bit later on in the Q&A. Now I think we can go ahead and get started on our fireside chats. I will welcome the panel discussants uh, to try to come here. So Corey and Manibali as well as the focus on I also am realizing that I don't think I've introduced myself yet. I'm just this random person talking about the great work of the commission. But I my name is Ruthie Gray and I'm the Policy and Research Officer for the Commission, as well as the youth coordinator. So I help uh, coordinate all of the youth work that we should lead on, including youth engagement uh, and several other topics that we're going to be talking about today. So um, I've kind of given you a little uh, introduction. We're going to talk a lot about what the youth uh, engagement work has been involved with in the Commission up to this point, as well as some of the visionary or future looking uh, activities that we hope young people will continue working with us uh, through the question. So let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, first off, we have Emanuele Capobianco. He is one of our commissioners. He was also referenced by Alona in her opening video. He is the programming director of WHO and has previously uh, worked with IFRC, so he has years of experience in the humanitarian sector. Emanuele, a question for you um, is, can you talk a bit about the role of youth in the report of the Commission? What was the feeling of um, the Commission that they had towards youth very much from the get-go? Um, and also, if you have a bit of time, it would be great to hear one particular aspect of the report that was significant to you in working with young people as agents of change. Over to you, Emanuele. Thank you very much, Whitney, and uh, a very good afternoon to the colleagues here in, in, in Geneva, and greetings uh, to all who are on, online today. I want to go back to the very first meeting of the Commission in uh, October 2019 in Berlin. We met in a beautiful room in Charité, uh, the hospital in Berlin, and as we looked around, um, I noticed that all the people in that room were 40 years old. Uh, like me, uh, born and grown into an analog uh, world. 
Um, I had my first phone at age 22 and I spent half of my life without uh, being connected on the internet. I'm an analog dinosaur. And I think I was surrounded by other analog dinosaurs, some of them extremely smart, uh, just not to offend my fellow commissioners. But it was immediately at that moment that we said, where is the youth? We are talking about uh, growing up uh, in a digital world, and we don't have right here in Berlin the people that are growing up in a digital world. And so immediately from the get-go, there was a, a complete change of, of the approach, and, and we brought in uh, youth uh, so that this report will be built by youth, for youth, and, and with the, the full participation of, of youth. We were very keen on not having a tokenistic approach. We were also very keen on not having um, youth that would be speaking as uh, 65 years old uh, UN bureaucrats, which sometimes happens with the representatives. So we opened up really the, 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 the floor. We had uh, we used we through UNICEF uh, the U report and contacted 20,000 people. We put uh, a youth team within uh, within the, the the commission, and we had several work streams. And, and, and I'm very proud of this, and I'm very grateful to, to the work of the Secretariat to allow that. And one of the um, outputs that I'm particularly proud of is the, the, the digital childhood profile that was developed with the collaboration of uh, um, thousands of inputs from, uh, from um, the U report from 170 countries and involvement with youth volunteers from the Federation of the Red Cross I was working with from, from uh, uh, Cameroon, Costa Rica, Kyrgyzstan, and uh, and Malaysia, and this uh, digital childhood digital childhood profile it basically differentiates uh, youth uh, across a spectrum that has on one side people that are digitally excluded, so youth that do not have access to uh, technologies that are not connected that are off the grid. And we know that these, we have 2.2 billion um, uh, people around, around the world that, that are um, no fixed internet access at, uh, at home. And then on the other side, we have the, the so-called digitally immersed children and youth that can live online in an harmonious way with their life offline and taking the best of the world and, and enriching that. And in between, there are a number of other um, digital childhood sites with bigger or smaller challenges from, from, from connection, from the health situation these, these, uh, these children and youth are in, from the um, type of environment where they are in, whether they are censored or not by their parents, uh, whether they are fighting for a, a mobile phone uh, or, or an iPad with, uh, with other uh, sisters and brothers and, and so on. And I think what came out of this is basically how heterogeneous uh, the, the, the different childhoods are um, and the need to look at what can be done according to the different um, type of, of digital childhoods that we have to improve their life, to improve their, their health profile moving, moving forward. And I think that heterogeneity is critical. We need more research to understand where, where people are and we need to work with um, with uh, youth to try to identify the, the solutions. And part of the solution are linked to connectivity and, and really making sure that the, the, the connectivity is, is, is expanded. Part of it is linked to digital literacy, uh, making sure that, that uh, um, youth and children are equipped uh, with the, the intelligence and the tools to um, scan, detect uh, what is uh, out there for their health, and, and link to that, uh, the need to protect. Um, as a father of, of three children of 15, 11, and six years old, I am very keen about the risks that uh, digital connectivity may, may bring, and so there is a responsibility that falls with families, with policymakers to protect uh, children and youth as they develop. I'll stop here. I look forward to the Q&A then. Great. Thank you, Emanuela. I think you brought up really quite a few great points in relation to what the Commission's kind of values and principles were in approaching young people as this work kind of progressed, but also from the beginning. Um, 
And I, I just want to say that we're going to post the report so that everyone can have it uh, who's joining virtually and everyone here in person, there are reports uh, at the doorway. So feel free to, to grab your own copy. Um, and we'll come back to a few of the points that you've mentioned, including the childhood profiles, because I know those are a really fascinating uh, part of the commission report that a lot of young people have really been uh, kind of latching on to. Now I'm going to introduce uh, Eno Awa George Stevens. He joins us from, from Cameroon. He is our youth officer for the youth team of the commission. Um, the team that Emanuele was just mentioning was developed at the very uh, beginning of this work. So uh, Eno, thank you for joining us. I hope you can hear us okay. We can see you very loud and proud in our main screen. I'm just realizing that in hybrid sessions, maybe one day we'll find the same size human face on a screen as the, the panelists next to you. But I'm glad that you're here. Uh, the question that we'd like to ask you today, Eno, is uh, please just feel free to share a few experiences you've had as the youth officer of the commission and how this has helped shape your role in creating health futures. Over to you, Eno. Thank you very much, Whitney, and hello to everyone. Uh, as Whitney has said, I'm called Eno and I'm joining from Cameroon. I, I joined the, 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 the commission, the secretariat of the commission last year in November. So I'm one year now within the, the secretariat as a youth officer. And uh, within the youth team, I was part of that committee that facilitated an open dialogue, you know, to, to hear the concerns and uh, propose solutions for young people, you know, and uh, what young people want to see in the digital world. And, you know, we had a consultation and uh, this consultation brought together uh, 35 participants from uh, 23, uh, uh, representing 23 youth networks, you know, and uh, we had a, a two part consultation and we titled it, what do youth want to see in the future of health governance? And we had three main objectives within this consultation. The first one was to hear from youth as to how they identify as a group, you know, the second one was to understand the main concerns and the proposed solutions with respect to digital transformations in healthcare. Uh, and the last one was to provide the space for, for commissioners to hear from the youth on the future of uh, the, health, the, the, the future of health governance that young people want to see. So these, uh, this consultation uh, uh, helped us to come together and to co-create a youth statement and a call for action to complement the report which was launched in, uh, in October. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the consultation underscored three main aspects, you know. From this consultation, we wanted to see the human right-based approach, you know. We wanted to see a strong and inclusive governance mechanism. And lastly, we wanted to foster digital skills, education, and innovation. So this was really something remarkable for me as a, as a team member within the, the Secretariat of the Commission. Thank you, Whitney, and I will stop here for now and give more overview within the Q&A session. Great, I know I'm just going to go ahead and show the youth statement video that we've collected from some of the youth that were co-authors of the youth statement and call for action that I know have just mentioned. Sorry, apologies. I think I'll start that over uh, once we have audio so you'll be able to hear it. Today, we call upon all the policymakers to recognize the potential of digitalized generation by giving them access to opportunity resources and access to use the digital as a critical tool to challenge the current norms. We call on young people to join the government, launch social enterprises, support the academe, and empower civic groups so that together we can champion human rights-based health policies, improve digital health literacy, invest in innovative digital health technologies, and boost youth participatory governance 
towards a healthier, more inclusive, and a more sustainable future in a digital world. What we are expecting as youth in the launch is the meaningful engagement of young people in the decision-making processes when it comes to the development of health governance models that dictate the standard of health and well-being of youth. This can be achieved through addressing the critical considerations and call to actions regarding the future of our well-being and safety in the digital world. Intersectionality in the conversation of human rights in the digital age is non-negotiable. Youth are not a monolith and as such, our diverse unique experiences must be the focal point in these conversations. Stakeholders must ensure that youth are not an afterthought but are active participants in the creation of our own future. Okay, wonderful. I think um, I will just go ahead and I'll, and I'll introduce the next panelist um, who was also, so we had four people in the video who were joining us uh, that were the co-authors. Uh, and I'll introduce the next panelist who is Ines. She comes with, from um, the International Federation of Medical Student Associations. Ines, I think you're here, but you can't hear you yet. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Yes, yeah. there you are. Thank you so much, Whitney, for the presentation, and thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, so, yeah, just talking about youth and its relation with IFMSA, and also picking on the youth and call, call for action and the statement. Uh, I just want to say that IFMSA had the opportunity to take part um, in this, and we actually had three of our members um, uh, taking part in the writing uh, of this call uh, for action. So it was a great one of the involvements that we had within the commission. But of course, uh, I just want to say as well, for those of you that aren't aware of what is it IFMSA, so we have been around uh, 70 years uh, and we represent 1.3 million medical students across five regions. So this means that we have a very large network of students, which we also aim to capacitate within our initiatives. And this is also uh, where I want to focus is uh, the, to bridge this also with the commission and with digital health. Uh, around the World Health Assembly, we always have this capacity building event. And in the past edition, we were very fortunate to count on the commission to support us and uh, where we had several uh, work streams focused on digital health and we actually had Emmanuel uh, and Ilona as panelists so thank you very much uh, it's really great it's really a great way to involve youth and to involve our members but apart from that it's not only about capacity building and we have started to put uh, a lot of efforts in terms of advocacy as well since we are also an advocacy-led organization where we have our own policy documents. And back in 2019, we adopted an IFMSA policy document focused on te technological innovation and digital health. And apart from that, since we attend uh, the World Health Assembly and our, the WHO Regional Committee sessions, we always have the opportunity uh, to advocate. And we actually made some statements uh, on digital health uh, this were uh, focusing on capacity building and on advocacy. These were, let's say, the main uh, pillars of work that we have been developing. However, this past year, uh, also with the support of the Commission in the development of a global survey uh, that we shared among our network to understand actually what is the knowledge of medical students in relation to digital health. And if they believe that they are being capacitated enough as future healthcare professionals and as health workforce. So besides that, we have also tried to bridge uh, digital health with universal health coverage and to work more on that lens. Um, and I believe that for now, this would be it 
but I will be very happy to reply to any of the questions that we, you might have in the Q&A. Thank you so much back to you, Whitney. Thank you, Ines. That was really great. I appreciate you kind of commenting to introduce, um, you know, wrapping up that youth statement. Just to get a bit of clarity on that, uh, it was the first time that the Lancet agreed to have a partnering document to the Commission report. And that partnering document is this youth statement and call for action that was written completely by young people. So getting back at a few points that Emanuele said at the beginning, where they wanted you to be a part of the Commission, but also to be their own kind of um, organization, you know, their own fuel to, to what they want to see done uh, and how that complements with all the work of the Commission. I also think Ines, it's great that you mentioned some of these capacity building activities that the Commission has uh, been able to do in collaboration with IFMSA. IFMSA is one of several different partnering organizations uh, that's youth led that the Commission works with. And I think that's a great introduction uh, to our next panelist, who is Corey. Uh, she's joining us. She works uh, with us on the youth team as well. And she's a master's student here at the Institute uh, and focuses on global health and environmental issues. Corey, your question today is, what are some of the opportunities as a master's student that you have appreciated as working with part of the Commission on the youth team? Thank you, Whitney, for your question. And yes, so I'm myself a master's student here at the Graduate Institute. And I think after working with you for almost a year, I can say that I feel very privileged to be part of a commission that is committed to engaging young people around the world in its work. Um, so this year, during the ECOSOC um, Youth Forum site event, we launched the GH Futures 2030 Youth Network as a platform to co-create and collate future research, um, advocacy, and the dissemination of the report. We have now 180 members, and in an attempt to bring these young people together more directly, we also launched a Facebook group um, in August, and this group uh, has over 100 members today. Um, so this youth network brings together young people interested in health and the well-being of youth, and the goals are to build a movement dedicated to digital health governance, um, inspired by the needs of children and youth, uh, generating dialogues and actions co-designed and co-governed for and with young people. Uh, on this platform, the youth team is constantly sharing opportunities uh, for global health governance, digital health, and meaningful youth engagement. Um, it is also a platform where youth members can share events, conferences, but also they can share their own interests their own research and dialogue with each other. Um, moreover, I also saw several members of this youth network joining the GH Futures 2030 Youth uh, Roundtables or panels, and some of them have also responded to a call for uh, youth authored blogs that has been published by us. Um, we also launched a podcast channel um, in which we invite a young person to join us in each episode. Um, in fact, our third episode is coming out next week, I think, and it will be on mental health. Um, and yeah, I think these are some of the um, projects that I have seen closely or had the chance to be part of. But I think this is why I encourage young people to join the network, the Facebook group, uh, so they can learn of future opportunities to work together um, in the future work of the commission. And well, since this event is focused on youth, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the Global Health Initiative. So I will introduce Amel and Lee. Um, both are, are students and members from the EHAID Global Health Initiative, an initiative composed by youth, uh, young students uh, interested in global health. So I actually have a question for you. So. Um, bringing back one of the points raised by Ilona, young people are leaders of today in their own right. Similarly to other student-led initiatives invested in supporting young professionals in getting active in shaping global health governance, can you elaborate why the Commission is of particular interest to the work of GHI and, why role, uh, and what role you, your members have in shaping health future here from Geneva? Um, thank you, Corey, for your question. Um, so, 
first of all, we would like to introduce a little bit about what uh, our initiative uh, do. And so my colleague Amel will give you a brief introduction of what our initiative does. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So the initiative was created in 2019, and it gives basically a, it's a space where students can uh, discuss global health um, issues deeply, and we do this by inviting speakers, experts in their field, and they share with us their perspective. Um, for example, last year, since I'm a first year student, I wasn't here last year, but they had organized events about climate change and global health and um, COVAX, um, protection of healthcare during uh, in conflict zones and the role of drug traffickers in Latin America during the COVID pandemic and, and during the reproductive week uh, they hosted three lectures on male contraception, abortion, tourism and sex education. And most recently, we hosted Grega Kumar from the IFPMA. Uh, we discussed COVID-19 response from a, a pharmaceutical perspective. Um, so, yeah, so we, uh, we are happy that the Commission tries to involve youth people um, in the topic of global health. Uh, and especially here uh, at the Graduate Institute, I think uh, it's a good thing because People come from all around the world and have different perspectives. And yeah, and it's a space where we can change and discuss um, sometimes sensitive topics in a more calm way and really constructive way. So I'm very happy to be part of this. Yeah, and I agree absolutely. What the initiative tries to do is to bring about a platform where everyone across discipline can have a platform to to discuss health in a neutral way. And um, even though being a youth member growing up in a digital world, I entirely echo the finding that was uh, reported uh, in the video in terms of, um, yes, we probably the, the class of, um, uh, of people who know a lot about um, technology, but we are also very lost in terms of the risks that we face. and. I think that we are more susceptible to be risks as well. And so in order to have the discussion, and well, I have to say that we were pretty surprised by the invitation because we were only um, founded in 2019 in the Graduate Institute. And you would assume that our being in the heart of Geneva, health would be one of the forefront matter at uh, the Graduate Institute, and we would have a long running um, initiative, but we're, we were actually quite early, uh, like new in, in terms of our interest. And as a student in global health, I have to say that it felt quite lonely, uh, interested in this field in college, because there wasn't any forum or an initiative that calling us in to ask for our opinions. And so we're pretty humble and excited mm -hmm. to join the, the, the discussion today. And I do think that this is an exciting time to have a, a serious conversation about these issues. And we really, really appreciate the dedication that the commission has um, put in to um, really engage the youth, the lost and uh, lonely, the know nothing youth to to um, put in um, some insights. And so thank you so much. Great, thank you, Amel and Lee. I think that is a, a very like authentic reaction to several of the points that you raised, uh, especially about being a student here at the Institute, that we're able to discuss some of the you know, issues that are a bit more sensitive, but also to collaborate and kind of see how we can overcome challenges together, uh, also areas to improve. So with that being said, I think uh, we will conclude the fireside chats, which weren't so fireside, but I think uh, they were really uh, quite meaningful and there was a lot of great points that were raised. So we'll go ahead and enter our second Vintimeter question, which is going to kick off our Q&A discussion. If we can have the desktop. You should be able to scan a QR code once it's on the screen. We all the people online can now see. If you are unable to scan the code, 
you can go to minty.com and type in 13547603. The question is looking ahead, how can we include more youth participation in the digital transformation of health? So, so far, we've heard a lot of great uh, insights about how the Commission was able to have this value system of what they believed uh, that young people should be involved with in the work of the Commission. If the Commission is about growing up in a digital world, of course, young people must be involved, but the how was quite challenging. So now we've heard several different ways in which the Commission has involved young people. And so now looking ahead and moving forward, this is what this question is really getting at. Great, so we do have some responses already coming through. Dialogue, opportunities, convening use, governance, consultations, resources, educational campaigns. Maybe our questions were too challenging to get. Uh, oh, research! There, that's one. <laughs> that's one that's had more than one response, uh, and resources. So that's a very that's a good uh, word map, and I hope that some of the panelists you'll pick up on a few of these points um, as we move into this Q and A section of the discussion. I am aware of time, trying to be a moderator and not Swiss by birth, but we are in Switzerland, so trying to maintain that. Uh, I do know that we were a few minutes over due to the, the class in the room to start with, which is why a few people online were confused. Um, so we'll try to stick, but we might go over about five minutes or so. So if you're able to stay, please do join. If not, uh, we do appreciate you, you being here, and we will leave you at a group share. So let's go ahead and get started in the, the Q&A. I think we'll go ahead and open it up to people in the audience first, since we're few and far between. Uh, it feels very intimate here. So maybe if there's anyone that has a question straight off the bat. Yes. <laughs> Hello, my name is Aileen. Um, Hello, is this working? No, it's not working. Hello? Uh, <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Eileen. I am also a graduate student here at the Institute. It was a pleasure to, to have this session with you today. Um, I, am, I would not say that I have a lot of information or that I know a lot about um, the digital um, movement and youth. But I feel like, since we're being personal here, <laughs> I feel that when I was growing up, I, I also grew up with the idea that technology was also a bit scary. Like, uh, I would remember my mom telling me, just be careful, uh, the web pages you visit, if, or if like someone tries to contact you. And that kind of, I'm 28 years old, and that stick to me, and that's going to stay forever with me, right? Um, so I actually wrote in the last question um, the idea of safe channels, safe communication channels. And I would love, I, I wouldn't know how to frame a more specific question, but I would love maybe to hear more what you have to say about that, since you are the experts. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you for the question. I think we can go ahead if there's one more question, maybe in the audience, and then we'll come back to the panel. Okay, great. I'll hand it over to the panel. If there's anyone that feels um, also virtually, Anno and Ines is here. I think this is an open question, though. So, Amadi do you want to give you a try? Uh, uh, sure, and, and thank you, Edina. I I mentioned in my opening remarks the issue of protection because I feel also um, very close to that. And I, I mentioned in, uh, in my role as a parent of, of, of young kids, but uh, in the report, uh, we talk a lot about protection issue and data issues. Um, in and I, my other capacity as a humanitarian professional comes from, from, from the humanitarian world. We, we know very well that, that people that are in distress, migrants, refugees, that are, need a lot of things, would be put in a position of, could be put in a position where their data 
are given away uh, in order to have something in return, maybe health services, maybe food, uh, maybe something else. And we had a consultation as part of, of the, the work of, of the Commission to look at the risks of, um, of digital technologies, particularly in, in settings with higher vulnerabilities where data can be used and misused and where people have no agency uh, necessarily around, around their data. In the report, uh, as a couple of boxes that actually talk about, about that. For me, protection is a critical element that needs to be inbuilt, uh, that comes from when you, when you bring solutions to having very strong cultural approaches and, and uh, adapted to, to, to the, the context where, where this will be uh, utilized and, and having a very clear uh, idea and mechanism for protection, particularly for um, young people of, of, of young age. And that comes also with huge investments on, on the literacy part that can start in schools to help children and youth to be aware of the potential, but also of the risks uh, and, and to be educated about what to do, what not to do with uh, digital, uh, digital technologies. Thank you. I think we will go to the web chat. There are a few questions, and Adash will raise those here. Yes, so we'll start with a very simple question that's come in, um, which is, what is the most meaningful finding or recommendation of the Commission's report? And I guess this is mostly for Emmanuel, because he's the Commissioner, but other people also, I know. Um... Can we keep that for the end and give the voice to other colleagues? Yeah. We'll respond to that. I will raise a specific question. Um, this is also for, for Anna. Uh, in some of the work that you have done as being a youth officer on the youth team, I know there's been a call to get more regional voices, so I was wondering if you could fill us in a bit about these um, new additions to the youth team. Yes, uh, really, thank you very much. So uh, we also, within the, the youth team, we, we also had uh, a process of involving more young people to join us. And so we, we recruited uh, regional youth champions. You know, we recruited five regional youth champions from uh, four continents, that's America, Africa, Europe, South, and Southeast Asia in October, 2021. And they joined us and it was a very, uh, it was a very rigorous process where we had uh, amazing young people who joined us. And uh, their main role is to support in the dissemination of the report and also to lead advocacy actions within their various regions. So I must say it's a very important thing that uh, we're not only limiting it to ourselves, but we're also involving many more young people to join us in disseminating the report. Thank you. Over. Thank you. And now I think this next question um, kind of goes hand in hand with it, and it's directed at the Global Health Initiative, but also at Ines. Um, so we have some people joining us here in Geneva, and we've talked about the nice atmosphere that we're able to have as students. But I think it gets at also that we've got a lot of young people joining us from around the world. Some of them were regional champions, as Anna has um, emphasized. But it's really getting at that we all have student-led initiatives around the world, right? And we all have our own objectives. But how do you kind of work together and um, not build bridges, but also make connections with people who have similar interests and passions, but maybe uh, somewhere else in the world that's hard to get to? Um, this also kind of gets at the digital divide, so it, uh, you know, it's an impediment to what we want to do to be able to collaborate together and co-create these futures together. And I was just curious if maybe your organization or also IFMSA has had any kind of solutions to how we can help to do this all together collectively. Oh, yes, thank you for your question. What is this going? Yeah, uh, we can go ahead for the person in the room, and then we'll go to you, Sam, um, In terms of our activities, when we try to reach out to experts or panelists for a talk, in this time particularly, we find that there is both pros and cons. So the cons is that, yes, we are in Geneva, but most things have been online. And, <laughs> and the pros is, uh, even though we're in, uh, in the pandemic, and we are totally aware of our privilege as being in one of the 
hub of um, knowledge transfer and organization that we have a team of alumni who are willing to to spend time with us because in this busy busy time to um, to find someone who has a spare one hour is is incredibly hard. I think one of the one of the ways that as an initiative we try to um, get over the the cumbersome of finding opportunity is is to really just do not we don't hesitate to reach out that we receive a hundred rejections and then one acceptance and that's enough for us and, and so being young that's one of the uh, of the uh, advantages as well is that we're quite energetic at times and uh, we don't really have a lot to lose anyway and so uh, that the mentality that we go with but uh, I do believe that the more the merrier, like if we can connect with other initiative and if someone um, reach out to us, we would be more than happy to uh, initiate a collaboration. Enix, over to you. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, just to, to reply to your question with me. So, um, for example, uh, the past year, uh, the initiative that I brought up a while ago called the Youth Free WHA, which is a capacity building event uh, to, to educate future and current health leaders, uh, young health leaders. We actually always make our events as inclusive as possible. And for that, for people that don't have the financial possibility to have the needed internet access, um, we were supported by the commission to provide them with this. So this was a this was like a huge success, and we will do the same for this year as well. Since we are planning to have our youth pre WJ, which is the tenth anniversary, um, in a hybrid setting, so that we can include both the people that have the financial means to attend in person and the people that don't have and at the same time to, to, to provide to those who, who don't have the, the needed means with improved internet access. So that is one point that I want to mention. The other one is that as IFMSA, we are represented across five regions. This means that we have 139 national member organizations um, and through them, their members, they have their national president is within our organization and has the possibility to interact with other national presidents and with the IFMSA team. So we have this direct connection where we provide support to our members with regards to different initiatives, uh, including um, organizing workshops back in their communities uh, with the, the needed quality, and we have had some topics uh, related to, um, to digital health. Um, of course, that right now it's difficult because of COVID, but for example, uh, in Portugal, in the beginning of September, I was actually the lead coordinator of that workshop, which focused on universal health coverage. And I included one topic uh, focusing on the bridge between digital health and universal health coverage and also the social determinants of health. So this is another way to get to people that otherwise wouldn't hear about these topics. So back to you, Whitney. Thank you, Ines, and thank you for providing some concrete examples of what IFMSA has been able to do in the past to kind of build that digital divide, uh, digital divide, but also to to allow for people who wouldn't be available at presentations or at events to be able to have that opportunity to join virtually. I think that's a really great example, and I'm glad that you mentioned that here. I think that we are short. Go ahead, Matt. If I just two two quick points. I I'm in global health because of, of IFMSA, and when I was a medical student, I was able to to travel between countries every year during during the summer, and I was exposed then to the world of global health. But when I, last year I was part of the, as a speaker uh, of the WHA preparation conferences, we had the entire world, students from all the world in that room, and it was for several days. And the quality of the discussion, the presence, it was amazing. And that for me has been an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary uh, platform that, that very, very powerful. 
and 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 to lead to respond to you one platform that I'm, I'm as I said I'm a, a, a dinosaur an analog dinosaur but one platform that I'm using and that has brought down barriers of age and distance is Twitter and 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 the feed your feed will come into my feed and I will be listening to, to what you're saying and you can you can listen to what I'm interested in and what I'm discussing and I've I found engagement on, on platforms like Twitter and, and LinkedIn to be extremely powerful and, and, and building building networks, uh, building alliances. And that is something that we need to do intergenerationally because there is so much that I think we can learn from each other, really both ways. That's wonderful. Thank you, Emmanuel, because I think those are good points that also get at the question that I was originally asked. So thank you for bringing those up. In the because of time, let's say, uh, we need to go ahead and get into the closing session. I know Corey has un was unable to answer anything in the, the Q&A, uh, but I do think that your points uh, were, were very straightforward in what you discussed during the fireside chat. And also just to say that you're quite humble when she mentioned the podcast, she forgot to say that she will be on the third session. So shout out to Corey uh, and be sure to listen into that third uh, podcast. So in closing, I just want to ask a simple question um, that we also did at the launch of the commission report in Berlin over a month ago, and that was to just ask for about 30 second response uh, from the panelists about the question is what is personally the most important for you in working with the commission? Um, I think it's important just before we go into the discussion, I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to formulate that uh, response is that this is a launch of the Commission report. We're doing several launches at the regional level, level um, at disciplines with various groups, including young people. So we have focused a lot on what the Commission did today with young people in co-creating health futures, but we are very interested in hearing from you guys about how you would like to see us moving forward with young people um, and what's kind of the role that they can play as we co shape uh, moving forward and reaching the SDGs in 2030 and UHC for all. I really uh, hope that you're all able to read the report as well, or at least the key sections that you're familiar with or interested in. Um, and I will hand it back over to the panel and we can go ahead uh, and close. So, Emanuele, Eno, Ines, Corey, Amel, and Lee. Uh, not all of you want to respond, that's perfectly okay, but just a few of you, uh, that would be great. So what was personally the most important for you in working with the commission? We'll start with Corey. Thank you, Whitney. Um, so I think for me, um, the most important and, um, yeah, the most important thing is that I, I could see very closely that I was part of a commission that um, was engaged in putting youth at the center of the dialogue. Uh, I mentioned very um, a lot of projects, but I know that this is a focus one that will be also part of the next project in the future. So I think this was very, um, very important for me. And I think that the commission also acts like, like a bridge uh, to con connect leaders around the world. And I hope that um, here in the panel and maybe people online or even in the future, uh, we'd be interested in joining these platforms um, as the networks of IFMSA, as, as Global Health Initiative and many others. Because I do believe that these platforms um, can connect young leaders and we uh, intergenerate greatly and and yeah, around the world, I think we can go create the future of digital health. Thank you, Corey. I think I will leave it for just one more one more remark since we're so short on time. Ines or Emma, would you like to comment? Really fast, uh, like 30 seconds. Go ahead, Ines, I see you first. Yeah. Yeah, so for the commission, I want just to say the availability and the support and also for providing this the safe space for us uh, as IFMSA to actually uh, contribute to the work of the commission. And looking ahead, uh, we believe that it would be important to even use IFMSA as a platform to educate our members with regards to digital health so that they can give back to their communities. Great, thank you so much, Ines. 
Um, just to wrap up the session, I think it's a, it's nice to kind of throw buzzwords around, but also just to end that in a summary of some of the key discussion items that we've had today around governance, digital literacy, the heterogeneity of the youth population itself. Some of the key panels or visuals within the report that are specifically interested um, to not only the people here, but also to the regional champions were mentioned. Um, and I also think it's important to kind of go back to some of the words that Alona opened with, with um, it's this huge misconception that youth are not leaders in their own right, that we're future leaders. Uh, and I really, I, I really like that because it's not, it's not the case. We, we really are leaders today, and that's the way that we need to have this mindset in moving forward as co-creating and co-shaping the futures. So just a quick thank you to, to Corey, Eno, Adash, and the rest of the Commission and the Secretariat, as well as, as well as Vladimir back here, who's been helping us with all of this technical support. <laughs> Uh, a round of applause for him, and as well as the GHC in supporting us, the Global Health Center here at the Institute uh, for this event. That's a wrap for us. Anybody that's in person that would like to have a short apparel, uh, apparel um, a few juices and things, we can go to the cafeteria. And everyone online, uh, feel free to reach out to us in the future if you would like to be connected. We're going to share the, the GHF youth network as well in the chat so we hope that we can stay connected thank you very much everybody and thank you to the panel for joining us thank you thank you thank you thank you